Oliver Otis Howard, November 8, 1830. October 26, 1909, was a career United States Army officer and a Union general in the American Civil War. As a brigade commander in the Army of the Potomac, Howard lost his right arm while leading his men against Confederate forces at the Battle of Fair Oak Seven Pines in June 1862, an action which later earned him the Medal of Honor. As a corps commander, he suffered two major defeats at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg in May and July 1863, but recovered from the setbacks as a successful corps and later army commander in the Western Theater. Known as the Christian General because he tried to base his policy decisions on his deep, evangelical piety, he was given charge of the Freedmen's Bureau in mid-1865, with the mission of integrating the former slaves into Southern society and politics during the second phase of the Reconstruction era. Howard took charge of labor policy, setting up a system that required freed people to work on former plantation land under pay scales fixed by the Bureau, on terms negotiated by the Bureau with white landowners. Howard's Bureau was primarily responsible for the legal affairs of the freedmen. He attempted to protect freed blacks from hostile conditions, but lacked adequate power, and was repeatedly frustrated by President Andrew Johnson. Howard's allies, the Radical Republicans, won control of Congress in the 1866 elections and imposed Radical Reconstruction, with the result that freedmen were given the vote. With the help and advice of the Bureau, freedmen joined Republican coalitions and won at the ballot boxes of most of the southern states. Howard was also a leader in promoting higher education for freedmen most notably in founding Howard University in Washington and serving as its president 1867-73, and aided in the charter of Howard University and Atlanta University, now Clark Atlanta University, in 1867. After 1874, Howard commanded troops in the West, conducting a famous campaign against the Nez Perce tribe. Utley, 1987, concludes that his leadership against the Apaches in 1872, against the Nez Perce in 1877, the Bannocks and Paiutes in 1878, and against the Sheep Eaters in 1879 all add up to a lengthy record, although he did not fight as much as George Custer and Nelson Miles. Early years Oliver Howard was born in Leeds, Maine, the son of Roland Bailey Howard and Eliza Otis Howard. Roland, a farmer, died when Oliver was nine years old. Oliver attended Monmouth Academy in Monmouth, North Yarmouth Academy in Yarmouth, Kent's Hill School in Redfield, and graduated from Bodine College in 1850 at the age of 19. He then attended the United States Military Academy. Graduating in 1854, fourth in his class of 46 cadets, as a brevet second lieutenant of ordnance. He served at the Waterleet Arsenal near Troy, New York, and was the temporary commander of the Kennebec Arsenal in Augusta, Maine. In 1855, he married Elizabeth Ann Waite, with whom he would have seven children. In 1857, he was transferred to Florida for the Seminole Wars. It was in Florida that he experienced a conversion to evangelical Christianity and considered resigning from the army to become a minister. His religious proclivities would later earn him the nickname, the Christian General. Howard was promoted first lieutenant in July 1857, and returned to West Point the following September to become an instructor of mathematics. As the Civil War began with the surrender of Fort Sumter, thoughts of the ministry were put aside and he decided to remain in the service of his country. Civil War Howard was appointed colonel of the 3rd Maine Infantry Regiment and temporarily commanded a brigade at the First Battle of Bull Run. He was promoted to Brigadier General effective September 3, 1861, and given permanent command of his brigade. He then joined Ma. General George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac for the Peninsula Campaign. On June 1, 1862, while commanding Union Brigade in the Fair Oaks, Howard was wounded twice in his right arm, which was subsequently amputated. He received the Medal of Honor in 1893 for his heroism at Fair Oaks. Brig. General Philip Kearney, who had lost his left arm, 
visited Howard and joked that they would be able to shop for gloves together. Howard recovered quickly enough to rejoin the army for the Battle of Antietam, in which he rose to division command in the two corps. He was promoted to Major General on November 1862 and assumed command of the XI Corps the following April, replacing Ma. General Franz Seigel. Since the Corps was composed largely of German immigrants, many of whom spoke no English, the soldiers were resentful of their new leader and openly called for Seigel's reinstatement. At the Battle of Chancellorsville, Howard suffered the first of two significant military setbacks. On May 2, 1863, his corps was on the right flank of the Union line, northwest of the crossroads of Chancellorsville. Robert E. Lee and Lt. Gen. Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson devised an audacious plan in which Jackson's entire corps would march secretly around the Union flank and attack it. Howard was warned by May. Gen. Joseph Hooker, now commanding the Army of the Potomac, that his flank was, in the air, not anchored by a natural obstacle, such as a river, and that Confederate forces might be on the move in his direction. Howard failed to heed the warning and Jackson struck before dark, routing the XI Corps and causing a serious disruption to the Union plans. Gettysburg At the Battle of Gettysburg, the XI Corps, still chastened by its humiliation in May, arrived on the field in the afternoon of July 1, 1863. Poor positioning of the defensive line by one of Howard's subordinate division commanders, Brig. General Francis C. Barlow, was exploited by the Confederate Corps of Lieutenant General Richard S. U. L. and once again the XI Corps collapsed, forcing it to retreat through the streets of Gettysburg, leaving many men behind to be taken prisoner. On Cemetery Hill, south of town, Howard quarreled with Meh, General Winfield S. Hancock about who was in command of the defense. Hancock had been sent by Meh. General George G. Meade with written orders to take command, but Howard insisted that he was the ranking general present. Eventually he relented. Controversy centers on three points. 1. Howard's choice of Cemetery Hill as the key to defense. 2. The timing of Howard's mid-afternoon order to abandon positions north and west of town. And 3. Howard's reluctance to recognize that Hancock, his junior, had superseded him. Historian John A. Carpenter holds that Howard alone had wisely selected Cemetery Hill, that the order to withdraw was probably a sound one, and that the conflict between Howard and Hancock might have been avoided had Meade himself gotten onto the field. Howard started circulating the story that his core failure had actually been triggered by the collapse of May. General Abner Doubleday's I Corps to the West, and this was a partial reason for Doubleday's removal from command of the Corps. However, this excuse was not accepted by history, the reverse was actually true, and the reputation of the XI Corps was ruined. Some argued that Howard should get some credit for the eventual success at Gettysburg because he wisely stationed one of his divisions, Mudge. General Adolf von Stein wears on Cemetery Hill as a reserve in critical subsequent defensive line. For the remainder of the three-day battle, the Corps remained on the defensive around Cemetery Hill, withstanding assaults by May. General Jubal early on July 2nd and participating at the margin of the defense against Pickett's charge on July 3rd. Also at Gettysburg, Howard's younger brother, Major Charles Henry Howard, served as his aide de camp. Western Theater Howard and XI Corps were transferred to the Western Theater with fellow General Henry Slocums, the 12th Corps, to become part of the Army of the Cumberland in Tennessee. They were commanded once again by Fighting Joe Hooker. In the battles for Chattanooga, the Corps joined the impulsive assault that captured Missionary Ridge and forced the retreat of General Braxton Gregg. In July 1864, Following the death of Ma, General James B. McPherson, temporary command of the Army of the Tennessee was given by order of William Tecumseh Sherman to the ranking officer on the field that day, Major General John A. Logan. Shortly after the success at the Battle of Atlanta, Sherman, who favored granting command to a West Point graduate, appointed Howard to permanent command of the Army of the Tennessee.
At the closing of his after-action report filed by Major General John A. Logan on September 10, 1864, Logan referred to his having served as commander of the Army of the Tennessee for a scan four days. Logan's detailed report ended with, I withdrew the Army of the Tennessee the night of the 26th, and moved it along the rear of the center and right of the Army to a position across Proctor's Creek. After putting the Army in position that night I was relieved by a Ma. General O. Howard. Howard subsequently led the right wing of Ma. General William Tecumseh Sherman's famous march to the sea, through Georgia and then the Carolinas. Sherman. Having favored Howard over John A. Logue for permanent command of the Army of the Tennessee, recognized Logue's success at Atlanta. In recognition of the outstanding leadership Logue displayed at Atlanta, Sherman asked Howard to allow Logan to ceremonially lead the Army in the May 1865 Grand Review in Washington. Howard agreed when Sherman appealed to him as a Christian gentleman. Ultimately, by the war's end, General Sherman would commend Howard as a corps commander of the utmost skill, nicety and precision. Post-war career Freedmen's Bureau from May 1865 to July 1874, General Howard was commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau, the Army's Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, where he played a major role in the Reconstruction era and had charge of integrating freedmen, former slaves, into American society. Howard devised far-reaching programs and guidelines including social welfare in the form of rations, schooling, courts, and medical care. Howard often clashed with President Andrew Johnson, who strongly disliked the welfare aspects of the Freedmen's Bureau, and especially tried to return political power to Southern whites. However, Howard had the support of the Radical Republicans in Congress. When the Radical Republicans gained power in 1867, they gave blacks the right to vote in the South and set up new elections, which the Republican Coalition of Freedmen, Northern Republicans who came South and were referred to derogatorily as carpetbaggers, and Southerners who supported Reconstruction, nicknamed Scalawags, won, except in Virginia. The Bureau was very active in helping blacks organize themselves politically, and therefore it became a target of partisan hostility. President Johnson called Howard a fanatic. By fusing the civil and the military power, the Bureau became a centralized dictatorship. Howard described the extent of his enormous powers as Almost unlimited authority gave me scope and liberty of action, legislative, Judicial and executive powers were combined in my commission. Andrew Johnson reacted to the meaning of such unlimited scope of action against civilians. The power thus given to the commanding officer over all the people is that of an absolute monarch. He alone is permitted to determine the rights of persons and property. It places at his free disposal all the lands and goods in his district, and he may distribute them without let or hindrance to whom he pleases being bound by no state law, and there being no other law to regulate the subject, he may make a criminal code of his own, and can make it as bloody as any in history, everything is a crime which he chooses to call so, and all persons are condemned who he pronounces to be guilty. The limited ideological framework of General Howard and his aides encouraged their attempt at radical reconstruction of Southern society without realizing the need for essential legislation. They thought that the elimination of all statutory inequalities, for instance, black court testimony, would be enough to assure protection. Southern states pretend to comply with this point in order to end the threat of the Freedmen's Bureau court system. Military commands and Indian affairs in 1872, Howard, accompanied by 1st L.T. Joseph Alton Sladen, who served as his aide, was ordered to Arizona to negotiate a peace treaty with Cochise, resulting in a treaty on October 12, 1872.He was placed in command of the Department of the Columbia in 1874, went west to Washington Territory's Fort Vancouver, where he fought in the Indian Wars, particularly against the Nez Perce, with the resultant surrender of Chief Joseph. He was criticized by Chief Joseph as precipitating the war by trying to rush the Nez Perce to a smaller reservation, with no advance notice, no discussion, 
and no time to prepare. Joseph said, if General Howard had given me plenty of time to gather up my stock and treat it to H-O-L-H-O-O-L suit as a man should be treated, there would have been no war. Subsequently, Howard was superintendent of the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1881-82. He served as commander of the Department of the Platte from 1882 to 1886 and the Military Division of the Pacific from 1886 to 1888. From 1888, his final command was of the Department of the East, Military Division of the Atlantic at Fort Columbus on Governor's Island in New York Harbor encompassing the states east of the Mississippi River. He retired from the United States Army at that posting in 1894 with the rank of Major General. The French government made him a Chevalier of the Legion of Honor in 1884 and he was subsequently promoted to the ranks of officer and commander. Howard University General Howard is also remembered for playing a role in founding Howard University, which was incorporated by Congress in 1867. The school is nonsectarian and is open to both sexes without regard to race. On November 20, 1866, ten members, including Howard, of various socially concerned groups of the time met in Washington. D.C. to discuss plans for a theological seminary to train black ministers. Interest was sufficient, however, in creating an educational institute for areas other than the ministry. The result was the Howard Normal and Theological Institute for the Education of Preachers and Teachers. On January 8, 1867, the Board of Trustees voted to change the name of the institution to Howard University. Howard served as president from 1869 to 1874. He was quoted as saying, The opposition to Negro education made itself felt everywhere in a combination not to allow the freed men any room or building in which a school might be taught. In 1865, 1866, and 1867, mobs of the baser classes at intervals and in all parts of the South occasionally burned school buildings and churches used as schools flogged teachers or drove them away, and in a number of instances murdered them. He also founded Lincoln Memorial University in Harrogate, Tennessee, in 1895, for the education of the Mountain Whites. Memberships General Howard was a member of the Society of the Cincinnati, the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States and the Grand Army of the Republic. Death and burial Oliver Howard died in Burlington, Vermont on October 26, 1909, and is buried at Lakeview Cemetery in Burlington. He died of old age. Legacy A bust of Howard designed by artist James E. Kelly is on display at Howard University. An equestrian statue is on East Cemetery Hill on the Gettysburg battlefield. A dormitory at Bodine College is named for Howard. The Oliver O. Howard Relief Corps of the Grand Army of the Republic provided funds to help destitute former Union soldiers and to support worthy public causes. It contributed money and the design for the state flag of Utah in 1920. An Army Reserve Center was named after him in Auburn, Maine and is still used today by several U.S. Army Reserve units. Howard High School of Technology in Wilmington, Delaware, is named in his honor, as is Howard County, Nebraska and the Howard School of Academics and Technology, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Howard, Kansas is named in his honor. The General O. Howard House, located on Officers Row within the Fort Vancouver National Historic Site, was built in 1878 upon General Howard's order at a cost of $6,938.20. Completed in 1879, the building suffered a fire in 1986 and was left vacant until renovated by the City of Vancouver in 1998. The building serves as the headquarters of the Fort Vancouver National Trust. I N Portland, Oregon, on the 150th anniversary of Howard's acts of valor on June 1, 1862, while leading his troops at the Battle of Fair Oaks, a commemorative wreath was laid by the Oregon Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission at the site of General O. Howard's former residence in downtown Portland at the corner of S.W. 10th and Morrison.
The month of June 2012 will be dedicated to O. Howard with a lecture and programs by the Oregon Civil War Sesquicentennial spotlighting General Howard's activities in Portland and at Fort Vancouver, Washington, and his post-war achievements at the Freedmen's Bureau, Howard University and Lincoln Memorial University and the Indian Wars. In a New York Times interview given a day after Mac, General Howard retired from the Army on November 8, 1894 at the age of 64, it was reported that he was traveling west to stay at his daughter's house in Portland, Oregon where he planned to start writing his memoirs. Selected works Howard was the author of numerous books after the war, including Donald's School Days, 1878, Nez Perce Joseph, 1881, General Taylor, 1892, Isabella of Castile, 1894, Fighting for Humanity, or Camp and Quarterdeck, 1898, Henry in the War, or The Model Volunteer, 1899, Autobiography, 1907, My Life and Experiences Among Our Hostile Indians, 1907, He wrote an account of the Civil War's Atlanta Campaign in the Century Magazine for July, 1887.he translated Theodore Borrell, Life of Count Agener de Gasparin, New York, G. P. Putnam Sons, 1881. In popular media in the 1950 film Broken Arrow, Howard is played by Basil Rysdale opposite James Stewart, who portrays Tom Jeffords. In the 1956 film The Last Wagon, he was portrayed by Carl Benton Reed. James Whitmore portrayed General Howard in the 1975 television film I Will Fight No More Forever about the U.S. Army campaign against the Nez Perce and the surrender of Chief Joseph in 1877. In Episode 6 of The West, he was portrayed in voiceovers by Eli Wallach. Howard is the protagonist of William T. Vollmanen's novel The Dying Grass, 2015. Awards Medal of Honor Civil War Campaign Medal Indian Campaign Medal Commander, Legion of Honor, France. Medal of Honor Citation Rank and Organization, Brigadier General, U.S. Volunteers. Place and Date, at Fair Oaks, Virginia, June 1, 1862. Entered service at, Maine. Born, November 8, 1830, Leeds, Maine. Date of issue, March 29, 1893. Citation. Led the 61st New York Infantry in a charge in which he was twice severely wounded in the right arm, necessitating amputation. See also. List of American Civil War Medal of Honor recipients. GL List of American Civil War Generals Union Sherman's March, 2007 Documentary Charles Henry Howard, Brother External links Elizabeth Howard, wife of Union General Oliver Otis Howard Media related to Oliver O. Howard at Wikimedia Commons Notes References Carpenter, John E. General O. Howard at Gettysburg Civil War History September 1963. Carpenter, John A. Sword and Olive Branch, Oliver Otis Howard. Bronx, N.Y., Fordham University. Press, 1999. ISBN 978082321988989. Simbola, Paul A. Oliver Otis Howard. In Encyclopedia of the American Civil War, a Political, Social, and Military History, edited by David S. Heidler and Gene T. Heidler. New York, W. W. Norton & Company, 2000. ISBN 0-393-04758-X. Cox, John, and Lawanda Cox. General O. Howard and the Misrepresented Bureau. Journal of Southern History 19, No. 3, November 1953. 42756. Eicher, John H., and David J. Eicher. Civil War High Commands. Stanford, C.A., Stanford University Press, 2001. ISBN 0 8047 3641 3. McFeely, William S. Yankee Stepfather. General O. Howard and the Freedmen. New Haven, Yale University Press. 
1968. ISBN 9780300003154. Sweeney, Edward R. Making Peace with Coach Eyes. The 1872 Journal of Captain Joseph Alton Sladen. Norman, University of Oklahoma Press, 2008. ISBN 0-8061-2973-5. Tag, Larry. The Generals of Gettysburg, Campbell, C.A. Savas Publishing, 1998. ISBN 1-8828103-0-9. Thompson, David. Oliver Otis Howard. Reassessing the Legacy of the Christian General. American 19th Century History, 10, September 2009, 273.98. Utley, Robert M. Oliver Otis Howard. New Mexico Historical Review 62, No. 1, Winter 1987, 55-63. Wall, Gordon L. The Good Man. The Civil War's Christian General and His Fight for Racial Equality. Harpswell, M.E., Arthur McAllister Publishers, 2013, ISBN 978-1935496069. External links works by Oliver Otis Howard at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Oliver Otis Howard at Internet Archive Howard, Oliver O. Lincoln's Monument in the Mountains, National Magazine. June 1905, with photos, Oliver Otis Howard. Claim to Fame. Medal of Honor Recipients. Find a Grave. Retrieved November 6, 2007. Oliver Otis Howard. General in the Civil War, Reconstruction, and Indian Wars. Biography by Oregon Cultural Heritage Commission. Retrieved November 6, 2007. Howard Memorial at Gettysburg. Howard. Imagine Oliver O. Memorial at Gettysburg Nadel Military Park in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. D.C. Memorials. November 2, 2007. Retrieved November 6, 2007. Oliver Otis Howard in Lincoln Memorial University. PDF. Oliver Otis Howard Papers. 1833-1912. Library.bowdoin.edu. Retrieved 5 May 2014. Army of Georgia Historical Society Texts on Wikisource, Howard, Oliver Otis. The New Student's Reference Work. 1914. Howard, Oliver Otis. New International Encyclopedia. 1905. Howard, Oliver Otis. Appleton Cyclopedia of American Biography. 1892. Howard, Oliver Otis. The American Cyclopedia. 1879.